Point Blank is a crime fiction podcast. It may not be suitable for all listeners. We discuss violence in all its forms. The works we reference may include period slang, which some listeners may find offensive. The hosts also have a tendency to swear. Episode 45, Richard Stark's The Hunter. And here we are at Point Blank once again. My name is Kurt, and joining me today, as always, here's Justin. Hello, people. I hope you're enjoying your summer locked inside. <laughs> hopefully, uh, hopefully some people have been released at this point. But we are recording right now in sort of the height of the stay-at-home orders, just so you know. Uh, so that will uh, probably warp our perspective a little bit today. But Justin, uh, you still doing well from our, our last episode? Yeah, I, I'm doing all right. Uh, it's a cooler day today for, for late March. We've had a good good round of, of high-temperature weeks. Definitely it's been feeling like summer's coming, whatever that means during the quarantine. But today it took a turn, and we have cool temperatures and thinking about maybe watching a movie tonight or something. I've been locked in the house, except for my uh, daily walks uh, for most of this week and the previous week, still teaching, still doing all that administrative stuff, but also spending some time recording some music. Like I'm working on an album for one of my bands, The Marshmen, and been enjoying that as well as thinking about crime fiction in this time of pandemic. How about you? Well, yeah, I, I guess some of the same. Uh, been probably watching too much on TV, but what else is there to do? I, I should do some more creative projects here soon. Kind of getting the energy for that now. But uh, we did CBS All Access has a free pass right now for a month. Yes. Yep. Yeah. We finished Picard off just the other day. And boy, I, I did enjoy that. Good. We we have only watched episode one, so uh, no spoilers. No, no. I'll just tell you that I, I thought it was very good. It's, it is different for Star Trek though, because of the overarching like season long story. Yeah. Uh, but I was, I was satisfied. Okay. We also, uh, we also started watching since we had the access, we started watching the Star Trek shorts and uh, Star Trek Discovery. I will have to say that uh, I enjoy the, sh- the shorts are a lot of fun. It's it's cool to see what different writers and directors and stuff did with these short little uh, Star Trek films, I guess you could say. You know, anything from seven to about 20 minutes long. It's, it's pretty neat to see other elements of the universe. Are those shorts uh, contemporary takes on Star Trek? They're not old things? No, these are these were done, I believe, in conjunction with maybe season two of Star Trek Discovery. Okay, so they uh, are new. S- That's cool. Yeah, yeah. There's And then there's like cameos, like Rain Wilson is in one of them. Uh, that was kind of funny. Um, and and that, you know, that does give some backstory to some of the characters from uh, Star Trek Discovery, which I will, just to bring it into our crime fiction podcast, in case people thought they maybe tuned into a Star Trek podcast, does start out with a crime early on in the very first season of Star Trek Discovery. So I yeah. enjoyed that. I'll say briefly, I did watch the first season of Discovery uh, just recently, and I did not like it as much as I hoped I would. That's all I'll say about it. Well, since I enjoyed Picard, maybe you won't like Picard and I'll love Discovery. Who knows? <laughs> Perhaps. But on to crime fiction. Uh, any uh, any interesting crime fiction news or writing related news for you, Justin? I've been working on a, um, a quarantine story called Rat Face. Uh, I've been writing 300 words every night and posting it on Facebook and on our Point Blank website. It's just for fun. It's lighthearted. It's a hard-boiled crime narrative. Uh, I'm literally writing it every night. I have no idea where it's going. So it's a fun a fun way for me to spend time and hone my own chops and also just think on my feet during this time of stress, but also a little gift to folks who just want an, a brief escape for two minutes every night. Um, that's been fun. I'm still working on, on the novel in progress. Uh, I plan on doing a NaNoWriMo uh, for, for April, writing you know a couple thousand words a day, and really just focus in on trying to get that in a, a tip-top shape for for uh, sending out to agents and whatnot. Uh, that's been fun to think about as well. But damn, I wish I had more time. Uh, the, a global pandemic can be distracting, especially if you have a phone in your pocket. Yeah, yeah that's for sure. But I, I've been enjoying your uh, your shorts uh, every night. I've been I've been reading those. As, so thank you for that. It's a nice little distraction. All right. So Justin, are you ready? Should we dive right into the hunter? 
get point blank with it? Yeah, I, I'm I'm ready. I'm excited about what we have to talk about, given given our reviews of this book. <laughs> yeah. The Hunter by Richard Stark, uh, a.k.a. Donald E. Westlake. Most of you know that by now, especially if you listen to our previous episode. Uh, this was originally published by Pocket Books in 1962, and the copy that you might have read, folks out there, was put out by University of Chicago Press, most likely. They, they did a reprint of all the Parker novels in 2008, I believe. Essentially, the story is like this. It tells the story of Parker. He's a professional criminal. He takes zero shits. In this story, he's betrayed by an associate named Mal Resnick and left for dead at a heist gone wrong in California. This takes place before the current plot wheel that we're part of in the present time of the story. In that betrayal, in that heist that went, went bad, Parker was left to die, but he did not die. And after a stint in prison for vagrancy, he escaped the prison and makes it his priority to find Mal and get revenge, naturally. So he travels to New York, and that's where we first see him walking across a bridge in New York. He buys some clothes. He uh, goes to a bank. We don't know who this guy is. We just know that uh, he means business. He looks for and finds his wife, Lynn, ex-wife or post-wife, because as far as she's concerned, he's dead. She was actually part of uh, the deal with the heist that went wrong, and she was strong-armed by Mal at the time to to favor Mal and to off Parker, so to speak. So she's in, in, a, in bad shape when he comes around and says hello. Uh, she's been shacking up with Mal at least for a while, but that wasn't working out. So Mal's paying for her pretty posh apartment. She talks to Parker. She's not too happy. Parker isn't too happy. His goal isn't her, though. His goal is to find Mal. He, we learn, Mal is now working for a, a syndicate, a crime syndicate called The Outfit. And this job was one he secured in part by paying back the, the outfit, the money he owed him, the money that he got in the heist, half of which belongs to Parker. So there's a lot of entanglements, but, you know, Parker wants to get what was his. He uh, goes from person to person in a pretty simple story. Parker has one goal, and we see him pursuing it person after person, interrogating a courier, uh, coming across a taxi dispatcher named Stegman, and sort of rattling his cage a bit. He's trying to find Mal and get to the source of his troubles. Ultimately, does he find the revenge he's looking for? Well, it's a fucking Westlake book. Like, of course he does. He has to. He's the protagonist. He's an archetypal anti-hero and he gets the goods but I won't spoil to you precisely how he gets that. I will say that this is a lean, mean, hard-hitting novel no frills, Hemingway style, lots of action cool sharp dialogue. I like that Westlake trusts the reader to uh, buy into the story uh, despite playing around with the way the plot's set up I would say that Parker is not the most lovable of, of characters, and I'm sure that Kurt and I will have plenty to talk about here. Typically, I'm the kind of guy who favors an anti-hero who has some aspect of ethical soundness or, or humanity. This guy, Parker, does not seem to have that. And while I struggle to appreciate ultra-masculine, tough guy, anti-hero assholes like this, you know, it sort of tends toward misogyny, just not a good person. Just not, you know, I can give a fuck about this dude, really. But it's fun to watch him do his job because he does it very effectively. And I think Act 3 is alone is really worth the price of admission here. So if you want tension, you want high stakes, no shit, hard-boiled prose with a, with a decent payoff, I would certainly say this is a book worth uh, reading, worth investing your time and energy in. I give it 4.25 stars. I haven't read the other 15 books in the series. I hope at least some of them are as good. Kurt, you have a different opinion. I do. This is perhaps really a, a first uh, four point blank where I have a fairly divergent opinion of this than than you do, although I appreciate some of the reasons that you gave for your good rating. First of all, I, I was going to correct something. I saw that there are 24 novel Parker novels out there, 24, but who knows? Jesus. Yeah, there's a lot of them. Yeah. Okay. But, but uh, I'm sure that at least one third of them are not good. <laughs> probably so. All right. So yeah, I, I'm going to stick my neck out there and say, uh, and to probably diverge from many hard-boiled fiction fans and say that I didn't really care for this that much. There are elements that you mentioned, such as, like, I think the prose is good. I think it's tight. Like, like I said last episode, the writing is tight and terse. That's good. It moves. But 
it's it's a three out of five for me because I just don't care for the Parker character. And it has nothing to do with him being anti-hero. It has nothing to, with, to do with him being a tough guy. It has nothing to do with that. There's no there's no depth of character for me whatsoever. It's it's a one note character, and there's no real character development from anybody in this entire novel. And that's not something that's very interesting to me, I guess. We've certainly seen and looked at anti-heroes before, many of which I enjoy. We've looked at, at tough guy uh, characters. I, there's many that I enjoy there, but th- this really doesn't do much for me. I generally like novels that come from the, the thief, the professional thief point of view. But, but Parker isn't it for me, at least in this book. Have you read any of his other books? Yeah, I, I've read some other Westlake. Uh, I don't have the titles in front of me. They were not Parker books. Okay, not Parker. Yeah, and I do remember enjoying that, like, you know, like probably in the closer to four out of five range. Like, I'm like, oh, there's there's some good stuff here. It's, sure. It's not his, it's not Westlake's writing at all. It's not his dialogue. It's, it's not his setting. It's not his plot development. It's really a characterization thing, and I, I just... I don't care for it. I wouldn't say that this book is for everybody and I'm not going to change my view, but I definitely hear what you're saying. Yeah. And there is not much character. This isn't a character development book. I wouldn't say that character development is a strong suit in, in, a, in a lot of crime fiction. True. I tend to prefer it when, when it is there. I, I note it and I, and I appreciate it. I do hope that perhaps this book offers certain things for me that I appreciate, but in the series itself, if you have 16 or 24 books about Parker, I would hope that there's some development there. And I'm sort of uh, hedging my bets on that, just like I found there to be some pretty good uh, character development in, uh, what's the name of it? Robert Parker. He did Spencer, which was a book we, we might, we might want to end up spending time on that series down the road. But Spencer evolved over the course of that series. And, and any good PI or protagonist should, if you're going to write a series character, the jury's still out on this guy. Uh, maybe he evolves and becomes a little more dynamic. If he doesn't, and we're judging him on this book here, uh, you're totally right to say that this guy did not uh, evolve one iota in this book. This, his goal was to find and nail this motherfucker, <laughs> Mel. And uh, did he do it? Yeah. Yeah. And again, I understand why a reader would enjoy this book. I don't want to start any arguments with anybody who enjoys this book because I, I see why you would. It's just not for me. And, you know, I don't want to argue with you about that point, but I, you know, I've, I've looked at some of the things that people have said about this character and uh, Lawrence block, you know, he says that in all the Parker novels, Parker never turns honest, never finds God or starts working as a secret agent. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. And then he also says Parker never develops a consciousness. I'm okay with that too. But what I what I do have a problem with is we never in all 24 of these these novels, you never get any backstory prior to the book we just read. That's a little odd to me. That's not something I want, especially if there's a 24 novel series. Yeah. And then I've also read, well, Parker doesn't have, you know, he really he only has one code. His code is that he never double crosses somebody that he works with. I read that somewhere. I'm, I'm paraphrasing. But OK, mm-hmm. well, if that's true, one of the very first things he does in this very first book is he's planning on double crossing somebody that he works with. Yeah. He, he's the original double crosser in, in yeah. the plot. So that's a little weird. That's yeah. not his code. Let's actually uh, dove, uh, veer ourselves right into uh, our, our deep dive here. We're already doing it, but yeah. we have a series of characters. And, and then let's talk plot because I did I did want to talk about that particular aspect of the plot, too. OK, well, well what about... The characters here, there aren't many characters. I think I've already named the characters that have any real role in this story. We have Parker. We have Mal, the antagonist. We have Lynn, the the wife who betrayed Parker and then essentially dies early in the story. And we have some bad guys from the, for the outfit, but they're, they're fairly two-dimensional. I mean, can you tell the difference between Frederick Carter and some of the other bad guys were they were they distinct or did they all essentially wear the same suit and tie <laughs> for me they all looked and dressed the same and acted the same yeah exactly the only the only distinction is where they were in the ladder so uh the guys on the same rung of the ladder were wearing the same suit and tie and the ones below them had a slightly uh, less designer cut uh, that was about, yes. about the only difference there 
Yeah, yeah. So character wise, we're really we're really looking at Mal and uh, Parker and, and obviously Parker is a problematic character if you're looking for character development. But uh, what, what did you think of Mal? Did you get a sense of Mal Resnick, who he is, how how he operates in the world? Did he did he appeal to you in any way? No, not really. Um, <laughs> and and I, I think this is. Uh, yeah, well, this see, is funny. Yeah, because that's the that's kind of the problem with this is like. Mal is, we're, again, we're not, Westlake has completely hesitates in this book to give us any real context of the characters. So we, we get the hint of Mal's backstory, this money, you know, he missed the drop or whatever, and then now he owes the outfit this money. And there's like one line where they touch on the fact that he used to be, he used to have to work with his hands and now he's, he's getting, you know, he's gotten soft or whatever he's still very stereotyped to me as, as the mobster. And there's just like, I don't know. He's just not, he's seedy, but not seedy enough to be compelling to like, really want me to either hate him or, um, or whatever to bring up emotion about him as a character. Yeah. I'm, I'm not going to be, you know, singing the praises of Mal as a character, but I, I did want to talk briefly about the, the beginning, which isn't the beginning of this novel, but but the backstory. Okay. We don't get a lot of the backstory at the, be, uh, at the beginning of this novel. We find Parker, like, in media res, like, already uh, in New York and actively pursuing yeah. Mal by, uh, you know, trying to pick up a new identity, get some money, like, doing this very, like, logical shit that he does because he's a professional criminal, establishing his character. Yeah, if I might... Go ahead. If I might, just because I've, I've been pulling a Parker on this novel by beating the shit out of it, uh, let me let me say what I do really like about the novel, and that is the the plot structure that you're about to talk about. I really love how Westlake did that with this this four act thing, and and not starting us at one point in the action and then and bringing us back and essentially uh, in a flashback to to the original setup. Uh, of, yeah. of the story. I think that was really excellent. I enjoyed that part of the, yeah. of the novel a lot. So I'm sorry, go ahead. That's precisely, I think, one of the things that made me really like this, appreciate this novel. It's it, it, it's the writerly things that happen in this novel. If this was just a, just a, a straight up yarn about Parker and it didn't have the bells and whistles and, and ingenuity that it has, meaning if Westlake was just a hack and not somebody with the skill set that he does, uh, I would like it less. But we, we, we work our way through the novel as, as Parker is going about his business, trying to get closer and closer to Mal. And then, obviously, he's going to get to Mal at some point. Right around the halfway point, he gets to Mal. But it's in a scene that is sort of left ambiguous a little bit, just a little bit, where I, I stopped and I'm like, oh, did, he, did Mal just see Parker coming in the window? Or is he just tripping balls out of fear and imagining it? And then immediately after that scene, it cuts. And we are, and we're back. We're with Mal through Mal's point of view, back in California, and we get the whole California story with Mal sort of plotting against Parker. He learned that Parker was going to double cross them, which you brought up. Parker was the first double crosser. They were at this heist in California. He wasn't very comfortable with the situation. He didn't really trust Mal. He was going to double cross Mal and get the fuck out of there with all the money, but. Mal beat him to it and strong-armed his wife, Lynn, Parker's wife, into going against Parker, pretty much by bullying her to do it. She did it reluctantly with a gun at her head. Parker was the original double-crosser. So if, if that's one of his life rules, uh, you know, maybe Westlake established that later on in the series, that, that that's his noble trait, then, well, not in the first book, apparently. But I will say, in terms of the plot structure, going back to California at the halfway point, it was an interesting move. And then after that, we have the whole, we have all that backstory material that we need to fully understand the relationship between Mal and Parker and and Lynn. Going forward, we work our way deeper and deeper as Parker realizes it's not just Mal he wants, but he wants he wants the he wants to take the whole outfit down. He wants to make them know that he's not a man to be trifled with. In some classic tough guy shit, which is appealing on one level, but also you know raises some questions of okay like it's cool to have freaking rocky or rambo kicking ass but at what cost or what's the point of it all is a is a fair question yeah and that's that's again one of my like kind of issues with this is that some of his actions as the tough guy make sense to me you know when he's beating up the gangsters and whatnot like that but even from a character that has 
no, you know, remorse about his actions or whatever. Like some of this stuff just comes across as plain stupid to me. And for Parker to supposedly be this, you know, competent criminal to make incredibly dumb decisions is one reason I, I just don't like the guy. And it's not a dislike is a, oh, well, you're supposed to dislike him. No, it's just like, I just don't think that's a good character. Uh, trait for ex- a stunning example of that to me is this this idea that you know he's in in prison for uh, vagrancy for eight months and he's he's there for six months and then he's like well I've just had enough I'm gonna kill this guard and escape well if you're supposed to be some like careful bank robber guy who like does one job and then goes into hiding why would you bring attention to yourself by not just sitting out your two more months on your fake yeah. name? getting out of vagrancy why would you up that to to murdering a prison guard where you know you're going to have like federal problems at that point that do, that doesn't make any sense yeah it's like he's confusing stupid pills with his testosterone pills or something yes i tend not to trust characters and you've you've said this repeatedly who who the author props up as being smart or the best at what they do and then they they do things like that just like stupid errors that would totally wipe any person out in the real world it's like that's that's a deal breaker your career is over yeah. uh, you don't kill you know you don't kill cops like casually uh because you're a little bit in a hurry like if, you, if you're trying to lay low yes exactly good point i'm not going to badmouth this book all the way through because I, like i said i there's a lot of things i like but one thing that really did uh, that was problematic for me and I, I know some people don't care about this stuff but i fucking do he kills a woman in the middle of the book in some, in the office he breaks into and he doesn't kill her on purpose. He's like accidental because he needed to use the office and, and she died and he was like, Oh, like she choked to death on like he, he brutalized her accidentally or on purpose. I don't even remember, but she ended up dying. He was like, Oh, whoops. And then he like smoked a cigarette. He's so cool. Like he's so cool that he could kill a woman by accident and not care. And it's like, well, well, fuck you. You know, why are you such an asshole? Why, why do I, why should I get off on this guy? And why do other guys get off on guys like this? It feels, and I mean, I'm going to go on a little rant here, but I'm not into like guys who give insecure dudes a sense of power over other people, particularly women or other vulnerable populations. I just think that's a fucking cheap cop out. And I, don't, I hate that fucking crap, but this book is well-written. Yeah, in in many other respects, it is well written. And but you're right. Like, and maybe maybe what you're saying right there is a little bit of my problem with the book is that is this character, and you know that I totally understand why he is going at the mob, why he's going at Mal, why he's even going at his ex wife. Like, there's you know ninety nine point nine nine percent of the time there is no reason to be uh violent against your partner but if somebody double crossed you shot you and left you to burn in a burning building that might be one of the reasons i get his his violence towards these people who put him into this position or i'm not put him in this position who'd left him for dead yeah. i get i get that but i don't like you said the the, the woman in the in the salon or florist or whatever yeah. that was i don't get i don't get that yeah violence against bystanders or innocent bystanders that's just that's just some macho ramble bullshit, and that's fine if if you're into that. I'm not. Well, Justin, you know, I think we've we've gotten into a lot of this negative about this book, but you rated it a four point two five, and I I rated it a three. And the way I'm talking, I probably could have rated it even lower. So let's let's talk about some of the things we really did like about it. We've touched on that a little bit. Again, that four act structure. I mean, the way this the the plot is revealed to us. I love that. I think that was great a great decision by Westlake. And I guess that is something that he repeats uh, quite frequently throughout the Parker novels. Well, that's good to hear because I, I would continue. I'm looking forward to actually reading number two and number three. One's something, something getaway. And the, and then the third one's called the outfit. So I'm thinking of reading this as a trilogy and just seeing how it sits with me. I like the simplicity of it. Admittedly, I've been I've been reading a, a number of books so far this year that haven't fully satisfied. You know, I'm I'm in a stretch where I'm reading a lot of three star books, let's say, and that drags. And and one of the biggest problems with with many things I read is that the authors don't know where to start, and the authors uh, don't trust their reader and provide them with too much information too early, too often, uh, in the hopes or in the fear that we're not going to get what they're doing, and 
that's to me signals a distrust in their own abilities as writers to convey what they want to convey it's refreshing in that westlake doesn't do that he says here's the book you're dropped in in new york with no plan you have no idea what's going on you're just going to sit on this guy's shoulder and and follow him and not even get an insight into what he's doing you're just going to see what he does and that's going to that's going to be enough and by god it is i love that confidence that's what really drove my interest in in this story that that confidence from the start and in like you said the strange situation where we we have the first act we have the the backstory halfway through and then you know we think the finale is going to be like in some classic showdown with mal but the book keeps moving forward and then it's the outfit and then even when we get to what i would consider the climax with the outfit and is in this shootout in Brooklyn, there's like a denouement where like the story's still going and, and typically that should not work. Did you feel that too? Like at the end, like he's still, he gets away and then he almost gets caught by cops and then he gets away. And then I'm not going to spoil the end, but he has to do a little more heisting. It's like, what, what, why is this happening? But somehow maybe it works. Yeah, no, I think it does work. Not only are we thrown into the story, but we're also shown that like this is a, this is go- it's going to be a series and this is going to be a back and forth. I imagine that the the outfit is after Parker in the future in future novels and that this is yeah. a this is something that he will be he'll be making scores against them probably many times down the road. And to sort of structure the novel where Here's a guy who's been who's been pulling these jobs before this novel even started. He pulled one job that didn't go well, and he's in this situation that we're going to resolve during the course of this novel. And then in the end, we're going to set this up so that he continues to do what he does. And that part, like, I, that makes sense because, you know, that's I think that's a trope you see sometimes in well, in television anyway, where you have a a series character. We know, I don't know when this book came out, if we knew this, but we all know at this point that Parker's not going to die in this this book because there's all these Parker novels. Yeah. And we also, based on, on genre tropes and everything, we, we know that Mal is not going to make it make it through this. Um, the author pretty much tells us that less than halfway through the book, uh, one of the yeah. cuts. And I think that's a beaut- that's a good yeah. move because that's not really what the novel is about. We we know he's yeah. going to do it. How is he going to do it? Mal is the catalyst for the story and incites the the action, but Mal isn't the big boss. Mal Mal is a is a minor minor antagonist and not not the primary clearly the primary antagonist probably for the series is the outfit and while that might evolve over time uh, it's clear it's clear halfway through but not at the beginning and and i do like that evolution where we don't know what's happening and that's west like not not revealing his hand too early he's not he's not saying well i don't want them to be confused and think that miles the he doesn't have this whole sequence with the outfit on in chapter two so that we know uh he just lets it all roll out as it as it does and and it's it's fun to watch him do that. Did did we talk about what Parker's dream is like or how he spends his life? I think we we hinted at it, but I wanted to just briefly mention what his goal is and how he lives his life as a professional criminal. Sure. Yeah, essentially he's an armed robber and he goes and he does a heist, he steals a bunch of shit from somebody with a group with like a, a band, a cadre of of other criminals if necessary. And then once he gets a big payload, he spends his days living in luxury motels for for months or years, just sort of chilling out and going out to eat. And then when he runs out of money, he goes and robs another thing or <laughs> steals another thing. That's his life. That's his life's ambition. He's already fully established as a character. That's he has no aspirations beyond this, it seems. Yeah, that's true. And and that's not to go back to this, but that's kind of where some of my problems arise with him is that, you know, here he is from what what little backstory we were given is he's the idea of the careful criminal, the one who, who picks his job very, very carefully, executes the job and then hides out, well, in his case, in luxury, but hides out for an extended period of time before doing another job. But and again, that's it's it's kind of weird because, I mean, really, at one point in the novel, that's basically what he says is. He's getting revenge, but he's only really getting revenge because he wants his money because he wants to go back to that lifestyle. And he's pissed that yeah. he's pissed that this screwed up his his routine, essentially. Yeah, I was thinking this story could have easily been a, a, a noir uh, where this asshole character sure might win the battle against the the outfit. But because of his maybe laziness and, 
and his inattention to detail, surprisingly. He gets burned at the end. And uh, I'm going to do a spoiler alert here. Spoiler alert. If you are afraid of hearing about the ending in detail in any way, you should step away from the podcast, turn it off, throw your iPod out the window of your moving car, and then run into the cornfield screaming. That is your warning. Okay, now I'm going to say a couple of things. At the end, there's this moment after he, uh, he does the money drop in the subway station in Brooklyn. He wants the money from the outfit that they owe him, the 45000 that he's requested by being a, a hard ass and uh, sort of just outflanking them and saying, like, he's, he's not going to go away. So he gets his money, and all these, these outfit bad guys, these thuggish dudes, are looking to cap him on the way out. And he works his way around that and gets out. So look it. That's victory for, for our guy, Parker. But then he, he ends up getting stopped by uh, cops. And it's because of some, a previous scene in the novel where he's in a convenience store talking to a guy. And the cops think that he's there because he's part of some kind of underground smuggling ring. It's like a very minor thing that gets brought back. So they accuse him of being part of this smuggling operation, and he is in trouble. Like, it might be it for him. But he manages to get out of that situation. He makes a run for it and escapes. But on his way out, he takes the wrong bag full of money. He takes a, he takes a briefcase, not his, but he takes the cop's like one, and it doesn't have the money in it. So we end up walking away with uh, Parker possibly having committed the yet another critical mistake that ends up costing him the money. And the novel could have ended there. It could have ended with, you could be a badass, but sometimes, you know, the, the little things matter and they cost you. But because, what's his name, Westlake wanted to turn this into a series, all of a sudden he's like, well, then let's have him go do another heist and get the money back and then go to Florida and hang out in the Keys for a few months. Okay, that's cool for a series character, but... Does that actually make the book better, or was that a cheapening of, of the story? That's a pretty good question, Justin. I It's not something I'd thought about before you asked the question. So I think my gut says that it doesn't cheapen the story, and that's sort of because of everything that came before it. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong about that. I, I don't know. It's It doesn't fit the character or the story that I think were presented by Westlake in the rest of the novel, where... Despite the challenges, Parker's going to get his man and he's going to get his money. I don't know. I don't know. That, that's, yeah. it's, a, it's, a, it's a good question. A, good, a solid question. I mean, when, when he walked out without that money, I mean, I felt terrible. Like, I was like, oh, my God. Like, all of this, all the violence, all the cutthroatness and all, all that preparation and to have it all fall away. I mean, I didn't like Parker as a character, but at that point, I was invested in him at least getting the damn money. And he at least earned it. So I was disappointed, but obviously Westlake wanted to make Parker a character that we, we would f- be interested in and following. I thought, well, maybe it, he shouldn't get the money because maybe he didn't earn it because he's not quite the guy who's worthy uh, given his so thoroughly anti-hero status as somebody who would take out anybody, including including civilians for, for almost no reason. It raised enough questions to make me consider it. Obviously, it didn't go that way, and uh, it wouldn't make for a 24-book series ha- had he just lost and then maybe got <laughs> dropped by a couple mob henchmen on the way to the train station or something. As a series, it kind of needed that. And and if there is a something, and maybe this is something I need to do research on, if I were to continue, and I would consider continuing with this series if I got a little bit more information about where it goes. But one of the things that I do like, and this this is relevant to the ending because it brings up one of these teams of thieves that Parker works with, is if I like this idea, this sort of network of professional thieves that he he knows and can contact. Um, and th- that that part would be interesting to me if they if we get more yeah. from those characters, you know, who are his contacts, what skills or what what are their problems? Maybe some, the other novels build on that a little bit more. And just Parker is consistently this more mysterious or straightforward character and the complexity comes from either the other people that he's working with or the the situations that develop there. If that's the case, then I might give it a few more books. 
it's sort of a little bit reminiscent of um, the Continental Op and, and his operatives who come in and they work for an organization and they're usually off the page, but sometimes they show up. And uh, I would like to see that happen here with the, the yeah this band of thieves and maybe a little bit of character development amongst them. You know that would that would be cool. I, I like that idea. We've talked about talked on the structure which we liked. We talked on the characters which we didn't quite love. We overall said some good and negative things about the book. Any final words on this book in particular? My final word on this would be, despite my criticisms of the book, Westlake is such an important author in this genre, and Parker is such a, I guess, important character in this genre as well. I think you should at least give this one a read if you haven't already, because I think a lot of people are going to love it. And if you're like me, maybe you, you won't. But I think like me, I hope you do recognize the good things that Westlake did in this novel. And for that, you know, I'm glad I read it. And I'm glad I can say I read a Parker novel. Will I read another one? I don't know. I'll I'll read one and let you know if I think you'll like it. That sounds good. Well, let's move on to Cinema Spotlight. Cinema Cinema Spotlight. Spotlight. If we did the Fox music, uh, would, would, would we get sued or would we actually get attention? We might be able to find some uh, close copy of that to throw in here. That's yeah, some super corny exactly Casio it. fanfare. Yeah, burr, burr, I'll, look, burr, burr. I'll look for one. I have a couple, a couple pieces for you folks for Cinema Spotlight. One of them is Point Blank, uh, the film of 1967, and the other is Badlands by Terrence Malick, 1973. We'll start with Point Blank. This is a very good film. It's based on The Hunter, so that's the connection. Uh, But it doesn't matter that you've read The Hunter or not to appreciate uh, the work being done here on the screen. The stylistic choices made by director John Borman add something the book doesn't have and doesn't need, but it elevates the film itself from being just a faithful, hard-boiled revenge flick to having artistic achievement. There are some really cool cinematographic moments, including the uh, main character, Lee Marvin, who's playing our guy Parker. He has this long sustained walk down a corridor with his dress shoes clapping on the linoleum like his beating heart as he's working his way to go confront Lynn, his wife, about the, the, the betrayal. And it's just, just little touches like that that show that the director is really paying attention and thinking about the human story here, uh, which is something, again, that the book itself lacked at times, uh, almost all of the time. Uh, another scene that was really cool is a psychedelic, color-saturated jazz club moment where Lee runs into some bad guys and gives them hard-boiled punishment, including a, a really hardcore punch in somebody's groin. It's just like no holds barred, and it, it's it, pretty fun to see. Uh, another thing I learned while watching this film is that Angie Dickinson and Angela Lansbury are not the same person. We first meet Angie uh, in the role of Chris, who's in the story here but not really in the in the book. I was expecting to see a slightly younger version of the woman from Murder, She Wrote. Turns out Angie Dickinson is not that person. She's very different. And I'm glad that I cleared up that confusion. (laughs) Now, uh, I highly recommend the film just as a film. But having it coupled with the book, you know, uh, that's even more special. Justin, I also watched Point Blank. So, uh, Oh, you you did? Good. I did, yeah. And I really enjoyed it. I I thought it was a pretty good film as well. I, I mean... In a lot of ways, I like the film a lot more than I like the book. That's for sure. I'm not sure that is it's Lee Marvin, right? The the lead. Yeah, I am. I'm. He's not how I pictured Parker, but that's okay. I liked some of the plot changes that they made in the in the in the movie, and I thought the cinematography was was pretty pretty darn good. I mean, it looks like they made it on probably a, a pretty thin budget, but they did a good job with what they did. So, yeah, I I highly recommend that film as well. They didn't call him Parker in the movie for some reason, though, didn't they? Did they? They called him Walker, maybe? I don't remember that. He's not called Parker. That's interesting. I thought that was a weird choice because pretty clear what it is. But anyway, yeah, I I enjoyed Point Blank as well. And this is the first time I'd seen the film. And I'm glad the film that shares the name of our podcast was a good one. Yeah, I'm glad we didn't pick a clunker uh, as a a title for for what we do here. So the next uh, film is Badlands, and this is a film I've wanted to see for a long time. And in fact, I I subscribed to the Criterion channel in part because I knew that it was a Criterion film and I'd have access. But it turns out Criterion 
doesn't have regular rights to it, so it wasn't even on the channel. I was a little bit ticked by that, but uh, I found it on YouTube a, a couple months back and watched it. First off, this is a grim, noirish film about a relationship gone sour by crime. Uh, secondly, it, it was fucking great. It's uh, made by Terrence Malick, came out in 73, and it has this sort of hazy, summery, old school feel. It's rural noir. It's actually, it's set in Texas, but it's filmed in Colorado, actually not too far from where I live. I want to see it again already very soon. I'm excited about reviewing it. But it features Martin Sheen as a wee lad. He plays the character of Kit, and Sissy Spacek's in it, and she plays the character of Holly. They're both like 18. They're kids. And in this story, they're a young couple who get into some young and in love wild trouble when Kit shoots Holly's father dead for some disagreement. Kit's a bit of a bad boy, obviously. They hit the road to, to run away together and set up camp uh, near a river till some cops find them. And it, that doesn't go very well for the cops. They escape our two young lovers and continue on, hoping that their love or their youth or something will lead them out of this trap. But we all know they're doomed. But it's a fun ride while it lasts. We get to spend time with them. Uh, there's great scenery, strong direction, like I said, from Malik. This was his first movie which is like freaking genius. And I'm not a huge Malick fan. Some of his stuff isn't great. I did not like Days of Heaven. But this, for a first film, uh, it's hard to do better than this. Great performances. I love driving through grasslands. It's just a thing. I am a lover of prairies. This is highly recommended if you are into hazy summer road trip noir. Really good stuff. Have you seen that? No, I, I have not seen that film, but it does sound pretty good. I, I might have to check that out. Yeah. I will say I was a little surprised too because I looked into that Criterion a collection as well or a criterion channel yeah like you as when i started looking at it I was i was a little bit surprised of what they don't actually have access to on their own channel so uh, that was why i i didn't yeah. get it so so far it's, i've been satisfied but you don't just get everything forever i've been really uh impressed lately with how many noir films and stuff i can find on youtube for free this yeah. this stuff is you know it's been up on youtube for like years and it's not like somebody just put this up and they haven't caught it yet it's it's been on there a long time and gotten a lot of views and so what it's a movie from 1950 or something like that who cares i don't really care about the studio getting their 10 cents or whatever for my rental that's Badlands too. It was just on YouTube. And, and you know, I get it. I, I understand the piracy game and I'm aware of how things work. Usually if something as well regarded by a living director is up on YouTube, it's, it's either gone in a second or it's for rental. But somehow this slipped through the cracks and I just pressed play and got the movie. So I hope Terrence Malick got my four cents. <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he did. So five round burst. Yeah, moving on to five round burst. Five Round Burst is where we do five reviews in, well, maybe not five minutes, but short reviews. I'm trying. Justin has three this time around, and I have two, which is a change of pace. So I guess, Justin, why don't you go ahead with your first review? I'm going to try to make these a minute each, or damn close. Okay. The first one is timey, timey, baby. Ready, go. Somebody Owes Me Money by Donald E. Westlake. This is a guy we've heard of. Uh, this is a fun read. The suspense builds for the first two thirds as a protagonist, his name's Chet Conway, gets involved in a case of mistaken identity, implicated in the murder of his bookie friend, and wanted by rival mob bosses for a host of things he has never done. All he wants is his 900 bucks. Is that too much to ask? He wanted off a horse race, off an insider tip. That's all he wants. That's his goal throughout the whole story. Of course, does he get it? You'll have to read to find out. I enjoyed the rising stakes through the first two thirds, but then things go off the rail. I think Westlake started to write his next book already. And there's this very, very long walking chase scene, the slowest chase scene I've ever read. And other things like that, that just feel like Westlake wasn't exactly in tune with what he was doing with the conclusion. But I would call this a non-fatal shot to the shin. One it was a good taste of what Westlake can do and then maybe what he does when he's not really paying attention anymore. Sounds like a mixed review there, Justin. It is. It's a non-fatal shot to the shin. That, that, that must ah. hurt, but it's not going to kill you. All right. For my first review this time around, I'm doing uh, Cutting Edge, New Stories of Mystery and Crime by Women Writers. This came out in 2019 from Akasic Books, and it was edited by Joyce Carol Oates. Now, I won't get into too much of this uh, collection here, but I will say it was a solid collection. I really enjoyed pretty much every story throughout. I thought they all had had some strengths. I didn't 
feel that there were really any real weak stories uh, in this collection. I thought it was sort of interesting that it's it's the three sections of the collection. You'll see a little play on words here. But the first section is their bodies, ourselves. Mm -hmm. The second section, a doom of one's own. Mm -hmm. And the third section is manslaying. And it has quite a, quite a lineup of uh, authors here from some very big names like Margaret Atwood and Joyce Carol Oates to lesser known authors, such as one that stood out for me was Cassandra Cause story in here I enjoyed. But uh, that's cutting edge. I would recommend it. It's always good to see crime stories from different voices. So that sounds good. Yeah. Good punch in the gut there. My next piece here is Where It Hurts by Reed Farrell Coleman. And this is a solid crime tale set in Long Island about an ex-cop named Gus Murphy who lost a son and who gets involved in solving the death of the son of a man with ties to the crime world. Vague enough? I could be more clear, but I only have a minute. The story is well written and reminiscent of other stories of this ilk, including works by Dennis Lehane and Robert B. Parker. But that's, for me, the problem of this novel. It felt like I was reading yet another angry ex-cop corrupt police force story set in the Northeast. And while I get that it's a big place with a lot of people, it just felt like I've read this story in slightly different form before. I don't know. It wasn't bad. In fact, I enjoyed much of it. But did it stop me in my tracks or make me think about the genre differently or enhance the genre? Not quite for me. It's a hit, but the wound isn't fatal. Thank you for that one, Justin. Uh, next up, I have the first book in the Billy Boyle uh, series. There's 14 books in this series, and this is the self-titled Billy Boyle, number one. This is James R. Uh, ben. It came out in 2006 from Soho Press. I got a hold of this through their, their cheaper Passport to Crime uh, printings. And I, I've been searching for something. I wanted something historic written in the modern era, but a historical crime fiction set during World War II. We're looking for something that was real kind of gritty and tough, and this was not it. It's set, of course, like I said, during World War II, follows Irish-American cop Billy Boyle. He's sent to England, and he gets this cush job basically because his like uncle is Dwight D. Eisenhower, and I didn't care for that connection either. So anyway, in this first one, he is sent to help uncover a spy, at the Norwegian government in exile in Northern England. That part's interesting. I like that part of the, the World War II politics with the government in exile and all of that. But this one was just, it was too much of a cozy mystery for me for something that's set during World War II. I feel like it should have been a little more, a little more gritty, a little more, it didn't really feel like what it should have felt like. That's a bomb that missed its mark. Ah, oh, well, you can't win them all. Here's my last one. Uh, this is one that w might be familiar to you, uh, having watched the show, Altered Carbon by Richard Morgan. Ah, yes. Yeah, I, I was excited about the prospect of watching the, the show on Netflix, but I, I, then I realized that there was a book and I dove in. This is a cyberpunk-ish novel set in the future where space travel is made possible by transferring human consciousnesses, which are called stacks, between bodies, which are called sleeves. The richest folk can achieve virtual immortality by constantly receiving their stacks and new bodies. So that's cool. Our protagonist, Takeshi Kovacs, is a PI who once worked as an elite soldier for the UN. So he's like a badass. But he's no longer working as a soldier. And he's hired by a very rich and long-lived man named Lawrence Bancroft, who has recently died and in a new sleeve uh, is investigating his own death and suspects foul play. The deeper Kovacs digs... Well, you know how it goes with these stories. Ultimately, this is a smart book. It's inventive, but it's also pulpy. It's not just dry, look how science fiction-y I can be. There's a lot of sex, there's a lot of violence, and there's a lot of Philip K. Dickian philosophy. In fact, it won the Philip K. Dick Award for Best Novel in 2003. Whatever that award is, I assume it's good. Though a bit overlong, which is about 80% of books, I think, I enjoyed this thoroughly, and it, it's a hit. Well, that's good to hear, because I, I enjoyed the show, but I have not read the books. There's a lot of elements to it I, I really enjoy that they did with Altered Carbon. I thought they blended up a lot of sci-fi tropes and noir tropes and stuff, and, and it was a series that felt fresh and interesting to me. Yeah, and that's how the book felt as well. Sort of like how Titan Shade felt. Cool, cool. All right, so that is Five Round Burst for this episode. So that brings us to another end. Justin, what do we have coming up in future episodes here? Coming up in our next 
two episodes, 46 and 47, Kurt and I are heading to Hawaii, where we're going to spend some time exploring Hawaiian noir. Now, in previous episodes, we never gave a specific text that we were going to do a deep dive with, and that's because we did not have a good selection, a selection that we were satisfied represented Hawaii in the manner that we wanted to see. However, in in the past month, a Point Blank fan reached out to us from Honolulu, and he recommended a couple books that we are both reading and enjoying, and we are going to actually do a two-for-one Hawaii noir deep dive. In episode 46, we're going to spend time with the novel For a Song by Rodney Morales, which is a detective crime fiction set in modern-day Honolulu. And in episode 47, we're going to read Yakadoshi, colon, Age of Calamity. And this is by Chris McKinney, who is a hard-boiled noir novelist. He's been writing uh, novels set in Hawaii for the past 20 years. He was not on our radar, and he is most definitely on our radar now. Some real good stuff. We're also going to spend some time reviewing a variety of books, including doing a featured review of Scott Kakawa's Kona Winds. Uh, so we have a action-packed literary fiesta coming your way from Hawaii in the next two episodes. Uh, after after our trip to Hawaii, we're going to do 48 and 49, and these are going to be dedicated to rural noir, particularly looking at Attica Locke's Bluebird, Bluebird, and also spending some time with a featured review of a new collection of stories by Chris McGinley called Coal Black, which has been getting some good press. So I think that will be a fun episode, and that will conclude our first 49 episodes with Point Blank, and then we're going to do a bit of a reboot and, and come in fresh for episode 50, 51. We haven't figured out exactly what we're going to do, so we'll let you know when we get there. Yeah, a special treat around episode 50, I think. We're just trying to figure out mm-hmm. what that tr- recipe is going to be. We're, we're going to choreograph a dance for you, the, the Point Blank Quarantine Dance. Yeah, yeah, that's right. We're going only to interpretive dance to talk about crime fiction and will be exclusively on TikTok. Yes, TikTok. That, that's what the kids do. Well, if you want to express your concern about us going to TikTok, uh, you can find us on Facebook at Point Blank Hard Boiled Noir and Detective Fiction. You can send us an email at Point Blank noir at gmail.com and don't forget to leave us a review at itunes if you uh, have the time a nice review always always is nice to see we do occasionally we did just get one not too long ago that was very nice of a listener unfortunately i don't have your name in front of me i apologize no i forgot to uh we fucked up but it was a five out of five and it said nice things about us it did that boosts our self-esteem slightly and makes us feel like this is a useful endeavor for the humans of the world. That's right. So uh, until next time, take care. Don't get too cooped up in your quarantine chambers. And even after all this is over, make sure you still wash your hands. Yeah, that's just just general life advice. Yeah, that and don't cough on people. Yeah, (laughs) yeah, you know, you'd hope. Bye-bye. So long, folks. Point blank is under a Creative Commons license. Music is by Justin. Copywritten works are property of their respective holders.